Welcome, Earthlings. <laughs> <laughs> to me, systems by design means looking at something from a micro to macro point of view. Looking at the details of an idea, and then looking at the bigger picture. For the past four years at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I've been looking at how design can have an impact on the biggest system of all, the system of the universe. JPL is just a hop and a skip away from where you are sitting right now. We're the lead robotics center of NASA. You may, remi uh, you may remember us from when we landed a rover on Mars in 2012. JPL is a city of engineers and scientists of all different kinds, from mechanical engineers to astrophysicists to astronomers. I think of it as a floating future city of people who make tomorrow come today. There's a lot of other people who contribute to this vision of the future. And this new area is art and design called the studio. The studio is NASA's first in-house design consultancy in history. My colleagues and I translate complex scientific ideas into easy to understand concepts. We think of ourselves as the middlemen between the space science and the public. So when I first got to JPL, I was really excited, as you can see, <laughs> but had a lot of catching up to do. Before I came to JPL, I would see these beautiful images of science, but I didn't really know exactly the journey of how they got there. So I began to wonder how JPL works, how they operate, and how design can impact the infrastructure. Can design actually help to boost a mission up to space? Can design help NASA and JPL think through their thinking? To answer these questions, I went searching for where spacecrafts are born. But this was a challenge because I was a foreigner in a new land with weird places where the language and the culture was different. And the demographic is also different, as you can see. <laughs> and I was the only product designer on lab. But here at JPL, the engineers are the designers, and the products are their spacecrafts and their missions. Design as I knew it didn't exist yet. So I became an advocate for art and design in general, taking on projects that were a little bit outside of my comfort zone. The thing is, is all of these projects, as amazing opportunities as they were, came at the end of a process. And then I found the Innovation Foundry, the focal point for ideas. The Innovation Foundry has teams of engineers and scientists who take a mission idea and push it through the proposal process. At the beginning of this process, or life cycle as we call it, there's a room called left field. Left field is a brainstorming room with colorful sticky notes and toys and sharpies and wall-to-wall -wall whiteboards. It's really what I think to be where imagination of space exploration comes to life. In here lives the A-team, which they facilitate rapid brainstorming sessions with scientists about three hours to 16 hours long to push a mission idea and then create it so it's more mature so that it pushes through the proposal process. So they took a chance on me and they allowed me to participate in these brainstorms, ideating new Earth missions. And at first I started doing things that were intuitive to me, mind mapping, sketching, and tinkering. But they started to realize that I was, I was contributing to the productivity and the innovation of these brainstorms. And it was because I saw things differently than the engineers. I was a new lens. So much so that they invited me to become part of the core team. This was the first time that a designer or creative strategist has ever been a part of a NASA mission formulation team. So some of my crazy experiences in a team come on Mondays before my cup of coffee at 9 o'clock in the morning during planning sessions. I'll literally hear things like, the cosmic microwave background radiation people are coming. <laughs> or, we need some dark energy guys. What, what are dark energy guys? <laughs> but my favorite is, put Pluto on the calendar for next week. And I'm like, <laughs> finally, Pluto is getting a chance around here. <laughs> but it was all these experiences of being confused, not knowing what the acronyms mean, or science speak, or the mission process, that actually added value to the team. I started asking questions like what or why, which I was a little apprehensive to ask such silly, simple questions. But at the end of the day, I realized that they weren't silly at all, and they actually contributed to the mission formulation process. I became a new lens for them, a new way to connect the dots. Connecting ideas together, connecting to an opportunity to a need, connecting the science to the why. 
What were baby design steps for, for me were huge steps in a new creative direction for NASA mission formulation. I brought them back a step, but I also took a step back myself because I realized that a little can go a long way. So I started introducing these sensory system tools, or new ways for engineers and scientists to make sense of their own ideas. I started off with the visualization sense, which is way out of the comfort zone for these engineers and scientists. I mean, there's no Excel spreadsheets or PowerPoints or charts or anything like that. But what they forgot is that in the 60s, they used to design spacecraft on paper. They used to have draft rooms at JPL. And they used to draw on the blackboards a lot more than they did now. So I challenged their intuition, and I brought them back to the drawing board. I also set up platforms for them to create infographics themselves. As an example, this is our Mars helicopter concept, which is, might go on our Mars 2020 rover. This was more of a mature mission, but the science team needed to visualize a way to traverse on Mars. So they asked me to help them. And what they didn't realize is that I wasn't just there to aesthetically put something on a piece of paper, but actually I contributed to the design of the traverse itself. During the mission formula formulation process, as an idea matures through it, it gets further away from being tangible. And artists and designers, we use our hands to think, and it's really intuitive for us. But rocket scientists, rocket scientists it's a different story. You know, they use their hands to, they use gestures in their hands to speak, but they need prototypes in their hands to develop their ideas further. And again, before software, we did use analog tools. So I wanted to bring that culture back. So what I did is I started introducing rough mock-ups to 3D printed spacecraft parts, a low fidelity to a high fidelity experience. I also uh, conducted spacecraft prototyping studies to see whether or not that rocket scientists can actually um, ideate with their hands. But when you bring macaroni and things from a 99 cent store and you tell rocket scientists to design spacecraft, they're a little skeptical. So you have to bring candy. <laughs> Make sure you bring a lot of candy. We started designing things like this, revolving space habitats with macaroni propulsion. <laughs> or things like this. And what we started to realize is that these mundane things, were, it, became a, it became great because they were less, less attached to the idea. They were failing often and failing fast, which led to better development. And it also boosted productivity and triggered new ideas. That's my idea, actually. It's brilliant, huh? <laughs> we didn't use that, but it's cool. Um, <laughs> and all these senses wrapped up together, and they were a collection of experiences of what it's like to be human. And at the heart of these experiences are feelings. JPL can come up with all these great technologies to fly to distant spacecraft and find the fundamentals of life, but how to connect with the audiences emotionally is almost as challenging, peers or Congress or, or even kids. And the reason is because sometimes, at the end of the day, it's not just about the science and it's not about space. It's about you and your connection to the universe. In DC, a politician might want to know when they're reading our proposals, what's the human connection to this all? What is the risk if we don't fund this mission we don't allow NASA to, to fly spacecraft to Europa. Well, the risk is we don't know anything about ourselves. We risk the idea of not knowing our own existence. So it's hard to fathom, right, that we're all part of this humongous system, that we're on this planet, within a crazy solar system, within an awesome galaxy, <laughs> and within a universe with billions of other galaxies. I mean, it's science fiction. It, it doesn't feel real, and I have to remind myself that every single day at work. But it's because sometimes people have a hard time understanding what does all of this have to do with me right now? So the question is, how do we make these connections early on? How can we get from the micro, the macro to the micro early on so that we can make those connections later? What if storytelling can be embedded in the infrastructure of JPL? What if engineers and scientists can become great storytellers themselves? So if engineers and scientists can develop empathy early, then maybe science stories will actually be even more compelling at the end. And then maybe we'll get more funding and we'll have more money. <laughs> Cycle. <laughs> but the challenge is, is how do you get scientists who are tr academically trained not to put emotion into their science, to put emotion back into science? Well, nobody had the answer to that. So I came up with a storytelling initiative. I help them discover the importance of putting themselves in someone else's shoes. And if data has a heartbeat, why can't science stories have heartbeats too? 
what I did is exercises with story arcs. And I had them map over their existing processes and science stories over an arc, and then plotting out what their audience is thinking and then feeling. These early space mission concepts became stories. Stories with an intro, a journey, a resolution, with anticipation and a climax, and a hero and challenges. But most importantly, these story arcs or these stories set up a platform for asking why. Storytelling then became a household word at JPL, so much so that creative strategy and strategic storytelling became an official branch of the innovation foundry. But most of all, this new lens created a new culture at JPL. You know, humans, we've been searching for our connection to the universe for, for thousands of years. And the idea of art in space, it's nothing new. But at the dawn of this new space age, design has the power to boost humanity beyond the moon. And we have the power to help NASA turn their telescope around and ask why. Thank you. Thank you.